what to say about Bud Krogh. Um, in 68, when Richard Nixon became uh, won the, the election for the presidency. He was an attorney uh, in a law firm with John Ehrlichman, uh, who became, he was uh, chief of staff and a variety of positions with, with the president. And Ehrlichman asked him to, to come. Would he, as a young attorney, want to uh, come to the White House? And as he will tell you, that's, that doesn't take long to, uh, to make that uh, sort of decision. Um, but what happened in the, in the months and, and years ahead as he took on work in the, the battle for uh, over, over drug wars, uh, cleaning up crime in, in Washington, D.C., and then uh, later with the, uh, the plumbers and, and Watergate, uh, things that uh, changed his, his career, changed his life, and I think that's why his, uh, his book, Integrity, uh, Good People, Bad Choices, and Life Lessons uh, from the, uh, the White House is so important, especially today as, as we look at at any administration and, and the direction it's going. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Bud Crow. And thank you all for coming tonight and, and braving the traffic. I, I thought Seattle had uh, intense traffic, but this uh, is every bit as, as challenging, I think, as Seattle. Um, this is a very happy day uh, for me. Uh, where's Justin? Um, in the back here is Justin Long. Uh, he joined my law firm in July of 2001 as a paralegal right out of college. I had a slot for people that wanted to learn about the law and learn how not to get in trouble as a lawyer. And uh, he signed on with me and uh, was there for two years and applied to a, an exceptionally fine law school at the University of Georgia. Uh, was accepted over four years. He got a degree in law, a JD degree, and he got a master's in public administration. Uh, went through this last summer. He graduated this last June and put out his applications for a job. And two and a half hours ago, uh, received a call from an assistant attorney in the office of Douglas County Deputy, what is it, District Attorney's Office, offering him a position starting on November 5th. So it's come from the first day as a paralegal to a job offer this afternoon, and I was here when it happened, and congratulations, Justin. So it's, uh, and I'd just like to tell you that uh, I'm not going to take credit for this building, uh, but um, in 1972, when I worked for uh, Richard Nixon, I wanted to find uh, one of the best people in the country to help us with a narcotics control program in Washington, D.C., and there was a gentleman here in Georgia by the name of Dr. Peter Bourne who ran an exceptionally good program. And so um, we in the Nixon White House just were not above going and poaching uh, when we felt, well, we just let's go hire this guy and basically make him an offer he can't refuse. So I went to see John Ehrlichman. I said, well, I'm going to go down and see Dr. Bourne because everything I've heard is he's one of the best in the country and we need him. He said, well, don't you think you ought to stop by and see the governor? on the way over before you try to hire somebody right out from under him. And I said, is that protocol? He said, yes, that's protocol. You should do that. So I came down here and I met with Governor Carter in the State House, told him what I wanted to do. He was extremely gracious, as, as he always is, and told him what I wanted to do. And he said, well, I think you can tender him an offer. So I went out to the program that Dr. Bourne was running here in Atlanta. I saw how he ran it, and it was beautifully done. I did offer a job to him. He did accept. He came to Washington, D.C. and became the eyes and ears of Governor Carter. This is 1972. Can you all remember what happened four years later? Well, I think that uh, Governor Carter had an exceptionally qualified advance man in Washington, D.C. that paved the way for that campaign. And I, so I'm not taking full credit for it. I just, I just know that, that, that Peter Bourne helped a great deal when he went up to Washington, D.C. What I'd like to do uh, tonight uh, is start out, first of all, this is the book, and I, I, I think you know that uh, the books, this is called the Author's Trunk Book Sale, that uh, uh, the publisher did not get the books here, but I never leave home without them, so there are plenty of books here tonight. Uh, I wrote this with my son, Matthew. I wish he were here tonight because, uh, there we go, right down there. The big question was, how big is the letter? I wanted him to be up there with me, but uh, the publisher overruled that. 
But this is very much of a joint effort. The way we work together, it's quite something to work with your son on something like this. I would do the first drafts. He would get them. He'd say, well, Dad, let's move this one over here. Go back, rewrite this. I did a, most of the writing, but he did a lot of the organizing of it. And the arc of the book, starting out with a story, and then who was I when I went to the White House, and what lessons we learned, basically the title of it, uh, is something that he worked out with me. So he's very much of a co-author. I'm going to start with a bang tonight. Uh, for some of you, <laughs> how many of you are Elvis fans here tonight? Oh, well, that's enough. I think we can, we can tell this story right at the start. In fact, when I was giving a talk not too long ago, uh, a lot of people knew about the, the Elvis story. And I said, well, would you like me to start with the idea about the book of integrity or Elvis? And it was just a course. Oh, Elvis, let's start with that. Then we can get to the other stuff later. So just I want you to come along with me. Uh, this is, I've been in the office uh, the president for about a year and a half. I'm sitting at my desk, December 21, 1970. And I got a call from Dwight Chapin. And the call went like this. But are you sitting down? I said, yeah, I think so. What's up? He said, the king is here. And I looked at the president's schedule. And I said, no, and no king's on the schedule. Uh, he said, no, no, not just any two-bit king, the king, the king of rock. He's right here. Well, I belong to a group of eight people who love to play practical jokes on each other. And I figure, okay, Chapin, this is going to really be good. He said, bud, I'm going to send you a letter that uh, Elvis Presley has written to the president. He wants to meet with him today. So... About three minutes later, a messenger rushes into my office and carrying this letter, and I read it, and it's like, hmm, this is a really, a really good practical joke. He must have had his daughter write this letter because it was sort of freehand with a lot of capital letters and all the rest, basically saying, my name is Elvis Presley. Uh, I have great respect for your office. I would like to help you out. Uh, I can go into any group of people, and they'll accept me. And he basically is sort of telling the president why he ought to, to meet with him that day. So I'm reading it, and I realize, you know, I am the biggest fan of Elvis Presley in this building. Now, I'm going to have to see if this is for real. So I called over to the office. He was staying under the name of John Burroughs at the Washington Hotel, which is right across from the Treasury Department. And I talked to a guy by the name of Jerry Schilling. I said, my name's Bud Krogh. I've got this letter from Elvis Presley. He said, oh, yes, Mr. Krogh, oh, oh, yes, we'd love to have this meeting. Uh, and I realized, wow, they're really... This is a very exhaustive joke that uh, Dwight's playing on me. So why don't you come on over to my office? Half an hour later, I get a call from the front gate. I'm in the old EOB and said, Mr. Krogh, I think Elvis Presley is here. And I think he's got some bodyguards with him. And he's coming down to see you because I cleared them in. He walks into my office. Well, it was an amazing experience for me. My hands were cold. I shook hands. It really was Elvis Presley. And he tells me a lot about his life, how much he loved his country, and I'm just going, yeah, yeah, I know. I just, wasn't that great when you were in the Army? How was the Army? <laughs> oh, really? Was the Army like that for you? And I mean, I'm just absolutely blown away. So I said, why don't you go back uh, to your hotel and let me see if the President will approve this. So a memo was written by Dwight Chapin to Bob Haldeman, who's the keeper of access to the President, and I write a memo to the President. Here's what we might do if we have this meeting. So we basically are set up. I get the word back from Dwight, the meeting's on. Okay. So I'm at my desk, ready to go over and greet him, and I get a call from the head of the Secret Service. I said, Bud, we've got a little problem. I said, what's that? He said, well, Elvis has brought a gun with him. It's a very nice gun. Um, this is the gun that Elvis Presley brought with him in a display case with the bullets. And this is what he had written. I have a personal gift for you also, which I would like to present or keep it for you until you can take it. Well, I didn't quite pick up on that when he was telling me that he had a gift that he might not be able to give to the president. Well, it turns, well, this is a beautiful gun, but it is a real gun. And I had to rush over to the lobby to tell him that no guns in the Oval Office was standard policy. He shouldn't feel offended that we couldn't take it. So we took the gun, Secret Service took it, and then the meeting starts. Well, you have in this building a beautiful uh, replication of the Oval Office for President Carter. President Nixon's Oval Office was stark, austere, forbidding by comparison. I mean, a really grim place. And when Elvis first walked in, he walked through the door and he stopped. And he looks at the eagle in the ceiling, carved into the ceiling, which you can see in this Oval Office. He looks at the eagle carved into the floor, 
the flags, which I'll get to in a minute, are next to the president's desk and can't move. So I physically usher him across the rug over to the president, and they're shaking hands there. And I noticed that Elvis was clutching a lot of stuff that I didn't know he was going to take in. So the meeting goes forward. The president takes him over to the service flags. This photograph, not this exact one, it's when they're, when they're both looking out, is the most requested photograph of any of the archives of any president. 39,000 copies have been sold at $10 a piece. It's a profit center for the National Archives. Um, just a little aside, uh, Elvis wore this into my office, and I couldn't detect what it was without embarrassing myself, so I wasn't able to get that. But I found out later he won that for setting attendance records at, in Las Vegas, which he pointed out to me and the president during the course of the meeting. And this is show and tell. He's showing a picture of, of his daughter, Lisa Marie, and the president of, you know, she's a very beautiful little girl, Elvis. Uh, now they're laughing. That, that look was capturing what the president was thinking. Why am I having this meeting? <laughs> Why am I here? Why is he here? Bud, what have you done to me? And I'm having a great time, as you can see over here. Oh, my, I mean, we're, you guys are together. Is this great or what? It's a big smile. Elvis having a great time. You know, he's having a good time here. Now we have the, the, one of the more bizarre parts. Elvis thought the president would be interested in his cufflinks. Now, why that would be the case, I don't know. But um, those cufflinks have been given to Elvis in Las Vegas by Spiro Agnew. And I don't think the president had ever seen vice presidential cufflinks before. Oh, those are really nice, Elvis. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so well, before we get to there, because they hadn't come in just yet, Elvis then asked the president, he said, Mr. President, could you get me a badge from the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs? The president looks over at me and said, uh, Bud, can we get him a badge? I said, well, Mr. President, you want to get him a badge? We can do that. And he said, well, you get him a badge, at which point Elvis stepped forward and he grabs him and hugs him. And President hugging wasn't the norm in that White House. Um, and so there they are, and I'm wondering, probably my last meeting, but at least I'm going out with a bang. Um, and then they stepped away, and Elvis is so ebullient, he said, would you meet my bodyguards? And the President said, Bud, do, do we have time to meet the bodyguards? <laughs> And you're in so deep, he says, sure, Mr. President, we've we got a few more minutes, we can do that. So in come the bodyguards, uh, Sonny West, Jerry Schilling, and they talk for a little bit, and then they go behind the desk. And I'm just going to show you the badge first before I go back to that picture. That's the one we got him that prompted the embrace. Uh, then the president goes behind his desk, and I want to sort of show you the desk. You have to look, and I don't know if you all can see it over here, but... Below the telephone were three drawers, and the bottom drawer has the gifts that the president would give to visitors to the Oval Office, and they're arranged in accordance with value. And the cheapos are in the front for people, you know, might have won the 4-H award for best cow in Nebraska, and she gets a golf ball or something like that, something thoughtful like that. And then if you are a very major donor, the gifts are very expensive, and they range up to 16 karat gold, gold pins and tie clasps and bracelets. I mean, it's really good stuff. So the president figures, you know, trying to figure out what he can give these people. He goes behind the desk uh, and is rooting through the drawer. Elvis sees the president, goes behind the drawer, but just with him. And I was asked, what is my most enduring memory of this meeting is the two of them sort of, you know, butts aloft, looking through this bottom drawer, to find the right presence. And then Elvis, because he's got his two friends there, said, remember, Mr. President, they have wives, they have sweethearts. Back into the drawer again for their things. <laughs> well, this is four days before Christmas, and they basically did all their Christmas shopping in one 10-minute shot in the president's office. And uh, I wrote a little book about this 13 years ago because it was the one fun day I had on Nixon's White House staff. Um, and... Let's see, let me move forward here a little bit. That's it. And these guys have written their books, and this is, meeting is one that they have all recounted. Again, that's, well, I should be doing it over here, shouldn't it? That's the badge. And that's the story. So did that t tell you the, go ahead, did you have a question at this point? It's a, I have one question. What did he get for the wives? They had pins, um, little pins like this. I think they, they were managed to 
grab a couple of bracelets. I mean, they were really, it was free-for-all in there. And they're grabbing, and things are coming out on the desk. And the president's looking, oh, he's cleaning me out. But, uh, you know, never had this happen before. I mean, can you imagine anybody going behind the president's desk to help him do that? What a great day that was. I would say 35 minutes was the, the length of time for the meeting as a whole. And the p pictures were taken at the beginning. I mean, can you imagine what we could have sold the hug for if we'd gotten that photograph or going through the drawer? I mean, it just, I mean, <laughs> life would have been different. What did the president say to you the next time you were alone? Oh, you know, it was sort of interesting. He, he didn't say much. He just sort of looked over and said, hmm, hmm, uh, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I met with him pretty frequently, but it wasn't like, what were you thinking? Now, I, d I do have to tell you this because it's, it's, a, it's what really happened, and, and I'm getting ahead of the story, but R Richard Nixon resigned on August 9, 1974, and I'll get this to the end of the talk today. And you might remember he, was, he had a pardon in September, and then he was stricken with phlebitis, and he was in, in a hospital. Elvis called him up, and he said, I, I'm, I know you're in the hospital. I'm, I'm praying for you. I hope you'll get better. I just want you to know that I'm, I'm thinking about you. Fast forward three years, Elvis is in the hospital. Nixon calls him up and wishes him the same thing. So something happened. Now, Jerry Schilling told me this after the book was out, and I would have put that in the book if I'd had a chance. At the time, I just didn't know it. And now, of course, we've got the integrity book out, and some people say, you ought to put another copy of this out. Now that you know a lot of this stuff, it's, it just remains a very interesting vignette of two people who were really icons at the time in their lives. And it's, it's just a, a fun story. It's sort of my Forrest Gump story. You know, I just happen to be there. Whoa, can you believe this? Look at this. What's going on? Okay. Uh, does everybody know who these two people are? Uh, uh, Ehrlichman. This is uh, Richard Nixon and John Ehrlichman. I put them right at the beginning of this because those are the two people to whom I owed absolute loyalty on the White House staff. Um, the way I got my job, as Tony was telling you beforehand, uh, right after Richard Nixon was elected in November of 1968, uh, John Ehrlichman was appointed counsel to the president. He came up to Seattle to my office. I'd been working in his law firm for about three months. I was right out of law school. And I had sort of hoped that if the, Nixon had won and if John got a position that maybe something would happen. But you can't count on those things. You just never know. So John came into my office, put his feet up in my desk, and he said, you like your work here? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, uh, would you consider another job? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I would consider another job. Would you consider leaving Seattle, coming to Washington, D.C., to be staff assistant to the council, to the president? Yes. That's how fast it went from the question. I was trying to show you how much forethought I gave to that question. That's a new definition of a nanosecond, you know, from president, yes. I should have probably thought it through. Was I qualified? Did I have the background? Did I have the experience? But when you're interested in government, which I had been through law school and for four years in the Navy, when you're offered that kind of opportunity, how could you say no? At least that's what I've justified myself uh, later afterwards. So within about um, three days after the quickest disengagement from the law practice, uh, oops, uh, now these are not quite the right ones here. Tony, can I go back to, should I go up here to, can you get me up to view? Okay, because what I'd like to do is, let's see, we can go back just to the basic show. There we could go. Now, did I hit a wrong button there? Uh, maybe. Okay, so I'm back. Okay. Ah. So three days later, I'm in New York City at this hotel. Uh, does anybody, you know, of course, I don't ask the question. Does anybody know what hotel this is? I can read. It's the Hotel Pierre, which is one of the more elegant hotels in New York. And my office is on the 11th floor, which I share with Ed Morgan, right about in there. And basically, we are vetting the stock holdings of people who are going to be cabinet secretaries or undersecretaries to make sure that they don't have conflicts of interest. That's what you have to do during that transitional period. So nothing will come out embarrassing later on. Ed Morgan and I were working together. We had the governor of Massachusetts come in, John Volpe. 
a very fine man, uh, but we had an appearance of a conflict problem, and that appearance was that if you walked outside the new Department of Transportation in Washington, D.C., there was a large sign brought to you by the John Volpe Construction Company. They're building that building in Washington, D.C. Now, there's no actual conflict because they got the contract before he went there, but there's an appearance. So we said, well, Governor, I think that uh, we'll have to change the, the name and managerial responsibility. And he said, well, well, I could take care of that. And he came back a week later, and he said, we've solved it. And I said, well, how did you solve it? He said, well, I've given managerial responsibility to my brother, and we've changed the name to the Volpe Construction Company. And I said, Governor, we're getting closer. <laughs> but uh, it really isn't the first name, it's the last name. That's, that's the problem. And could you maybe go back and work on this a little bit more? And he said he would. Uh, this room was a unique room. Uh, it, uh, we had uh, desks that faced each other. And there were three doors that went in this room. One went to the hall, one went into the closet, and one went into the restroom. And we finished with another cabinet nominee. His lawyer left, and this person who was going into the cabinet turned around and walked into our closet. <laughs> now, there, there's no problem if you come out right away. You know, you can say, you know, I made a mistake. But he didn't. Um, <laughs> so we have this gentleman in our closet, and Ed Morgan is looking at me, and I'm looking at Ed, and this is the hardest time I've ever had in my life, not to lose it. And we cannot laugh, we cannot even indicate that we have this nominee in our closet. <laughs> and Ed and I, we were lawyers together, we would, every, every year we'd call each other and say, how long was he in our closet? And we all say, 27 seconds, at which point we both collapse again. Well, after 27 seconds, the doorknob begins to turn ever so slowly, and the gentleman oozed his way out into the hall. Now, we collapsed. We were dysfunctional from that point on. We went out onto Fifth Avenue and sang Broadway show tunes for the next two hours. It was right before Christmas. I think people thought we might not be all together all together. Um, we spent another month and a half at this, at this building in the Hotel Pierre. And then we moved down to Washington, D.C. I'll show you where I had my office there. I, actually, my office was not on the roof, as this indicates. Uh, this is the West Wing. Uh, my office was right next to Ehrlichman's office, which is right above the Oval Office. He used to go down quite frequently. I would go down on occasion. Uh, but that's where I started out with working and then was promoted and moved over to this building. Not to, no, I'll get to the other building later. I'm going to talk about this first. Um, issues come to you quickly on the White House staff. And sometimes you're prepared for them, sometimes you're not. I was not in this case. Uh, I was sitting at my office, and Virginia Nauer, who is the President's Consumer Affairs Advisor, said, Bud, I need to testify tomorrow before a House Agricultural Committee, and I'd like to testify in support of reducing the fat content of the American hot dog from 32% to 30%. Now, my mind's eye, a hot dog is six inches long, two inches, uh, you know, 2 percent is not much of a hot dog. Go ahead, Virginia. Testify. It's okay. Question comes back. But is that the president's position? Uh, I mean, does he support reducing the fat content by 2% in the hot dog? Again, I'm thinking of a hot dog. 2% fat, not much of a Go with it. So she testifies. And I didn't think anything more about it that day. Well, um, the next day, there was a story that came out, which I'll try to get here. Major administration shift on weaning. <laughs> and the calls started coming in from the meat packers in Colorado, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Illinois, just basically any place where there's a meat packing plant that makes hot dogs. And the questions from the meat packers to the White House was who is the idiot that approved reducing the fat content? from 32% to 30%. Now, all the vectors are coming into my office. I mean, I, I'm the one. So this would have been the shortest-lived White House staff job on record, and in retrospect, that would have been a good thing. Uh, but it wasn't. Now, what happened was the president saw this story, didn't know about the calls we're getting from the meatpackers, and he picks up the phone and he calls Virginia Nauer. She called me right afterwards, and she's sort of paraphrasing to me what the president is telling her. And I'm going to try to make it sound how I think Nixon would have sounded in calling her. Stick to your guns, Virginia. I'm behind you 100 percent. 
Uh, I came from humble origins. Why, we were raised on hot dogs and hamburgers. We've got to look after the hot dog. Oh, you have no idea how beautiful that sounded to me. We've got to look after the hot dog. That's better than we have nothing to fear but fear itself or ask not what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country. We've got to look after the hot dog. To me, remains the most beautiful presidential statement ever made. I said, you know, Virginia, I'm so glad the president did that. Now, would you please call Time Magazine, Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report, The Washington Post, The New York Times, Chicago Tribune, L.A. Times, and tell them exactly what the president just said. I think this is a lovely story. She said, oh, I do too. I think it's a wonderful story. So she did. The calls stopped. So that saved my bacon. Um, but the point I want to make and why I put the story there is I hadn't thought through the consequences of that decision because it was a huge economic impact on the meatpacking industry, and I should have done that. The fact that we had a good nutritional outcome, we may have gotten to that point, but we ought to have evaluated it compared to the other effects of that judgment, which we didn't do. And the basic theme of our new book is that integrity requires thinking through second, third, and fourth order consequences of the decisions that you're making. And we just didn't do it there. Now, this was one where, again, I could have gone home very quickly and fortunately, you know, for whatever, where the stars were aligned that day when Nixon saw the story, he didn't connect the economic dots either. But that was really my job, and I, shouldn't, I should have done that. Now I'm going to move to one that's a little more serious. Does this a gentleman's name uh, ring a bell? G. Harold Carswell was one of President Nixon's nominees to the court. Uh, I was a, a fairly junior when he was nominated to the Supreme Court by President Nixon. And I was asked to come over to the Justice Department to meet with the Attorney General, John Mitchell, the Deputy Attorney General, Dick Kleindienst, and with, with Judge Carswell. And during the course of the lunch that we had, uh, the Attorney, Deputy Attorney General, Kleindienst, turned to Carswell and he said, now, Judge, have you ever said anything? that could be construed as racist, because this is going to be a bruising battle before the Senate Judiciary Committee. We need to know that so we can take proper precautions. And I'd read the full field investigation, had seen nothing that looked problematical. And then the judge said, well, no, um, Mr. Kleindienst, I have not said anything, but I, I don't think those thoughts ever. And it was an over answer to the question that was posed to him. And I sort of picked up on it, and I went back to see Ehrlichman after the meeting. I said, you know, I'm, there's something here that doesn't feel quite right, but I'm not confident enough that I, I, I'm on to something that we ought to stop the nomination. Because he asked me, he said, are you prepared at this point to slow it down and do more investigation and more checking and the rest? Now, I, I didn't follow my intuition, my hunch. I said, no, I'm, I'm just not ready to do that. He said, okay, well, we're going to send the nomination forward tomorrow. This is it. And they did. Well, a reporter operating here, I think in Atlanta, uh, Judge Carswell had run for the state legislature here in Georgia uh, in 1948, and it was for a seat, you know, I think, in the House of the, of the Georgia legislature. And this is the state statement that this reporter found. I believe that segregation of the races, races is proper and the only practical and correct way of life in our states. I yield to no man in the firm, vigorous belief in the principles of white supremacy, and I shall always be so governed. Well, um, it would have been nice to know that beforehand. Uh, just so I, I, I think that would have changed the whole process. I doubt whether he would have been nominated. But the nomination did go forward, and we lost. We lost in the Senate 51 to 48 uh, on that vote. Now, a lot of law professors, and Justin knows this, have written about that, and they have come back to who was asleep at the switch in the White House and let that go through. Well, that's my office. That was me. And I put this out there because, again, in those jobs, you need to be thinking through and following your hunches. I, I didn't really think things through with a hot dog story here. I just didn't follow my intuition. I didn't do that. And, and I regret that. Now, we ended up later on nominating William Rehnquist 
to the Supreme Court, which I think was probably the most important thing that Richard Nixon did as president in terms of affecting our lives because he served on the court for a very long time <clears throat> in a very distinguished way. Moving forward. This was the picture I was going to show you a little bit earlier where I moved after I'd worked in, in the West Wing over to the old executive office building. Um, I show this to you because um, this is where, thinking that we were doing something that was proper, we set up a special office called Room 16. Now, why did we do that? In July of 1971, I had just come back from Vietnam where I'd been working on narcotics programs. I met with the president on July 17th. 1971, to report in what we had seen in Vietnam because we were basically solving the problem of heroin addiction in, in South Vietnam. Two days before, the president had gone to the NBC studios in Burbank and announced to the world, maybe some of you remember this, that uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger has just returned from China with an invitation from Zhou Enlai for me to visit the People's Republic of China. I have decided to accept that invitation and we'll be going to China within the next six months. How many of you remember that? That, that, that was a major, major announcement in the world, that our, the American president is going to China. I believe that was probably the boldest diplomatic action of his presidency. Uh, it took courage. It took vision. It took the very best that I think Richard Nixon had as president. Two days later, I'm meeting with the president, reporting to him on the drug control program in South Vietnam. After the meeting, I'm in the White House mess. This is out in San Clemente in California where he would vacation. And Jonna Hureska, John Ehrlichman's secretary, comes to see me, and she said, um, John wants to see you right away. So I went into his office because when, when you're summoned, you go immediately, and they shut the door. Now, that's unusual. Um, it was John Ehrlichman and myself behind a closed door in the inner sanctum of offices in the Western White House, which struck me as a little bizarre, what's going on here? And he handed me a large bucket file, the kind that lawyers use, had Pentagon papers written on the side of it. This is July 17th, and the reason I'm giving you dates is because I want you to see the pace of decision making and what led to what I think was the reason we had Watergate and uh, a president resigning. John said, the president views the release of the Pentagon Papers, a top secret history of the Vietnam War, up through the end of the Lyndon Johnson administration as a matter of the highest national security importance. He wants you to find out why they were released. Who was involved in it besides Dr. Ellsberg? Is it a conspiracy? We've got to stop these things from happening in the future. I said, well, well, what do you want me to do? He said, the president has decided to appoint you as co-director of a special investigations unit. You will be joined in this unit by David Young from Dr. Henry Kissinger's staff. And you all might remember that Kissinger was then the national security advisor to the president. Ehrlichman was chief counsel and at that point was also assistant to the president. I said, okay, uh, when do you want me to start? And he said, we want you to start now. And you were to go back to your hotel and read the first chapter in Richard Nixon's book, Six Crises on Alger Hiss. Does that name Alger Hiss ring a bell for some of you too? Th this was really made, that's right, this made Richard Nixon's career, the investigation of Alger Hiss. And you are to derive from reading that chapter how Richard Nixon views Daniel Ellsberg. He sees him as a traitor, somebody who has released these documents. We cannot allow this to happen in the future. I did read that, and in the book I have a, a lengthy section on as I'm reading it, what am I thinking while I'm reading that chapter on Elger Hiss. That was on a Saturday. Uh, Sunday, we all got plane and flew back on Air Force One to Washington, D.C., and we set up an office. <clears throat> Let's see, that's not the... My office is on this side of the building. If you go around the old EOB on 17th, there's a little park, and you all know where the, uh, the, uh, the ellipse is on this side over there. There's a little nondescript office that we set up uh, uh, sort of the headquarters for the Special Investigations Unit. David Young and I were the co-directors, and we hired two people, G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt. Do those names ring a bell for some of you? Maybe personnel wasn't my strong suit. But um, G. Gordon Liddy came over from the Department of the Treasury, um, went to work for me. He had had a lengthy FBI career. E. Howard Hunt had come from the CIA, <coughs> and... 
we started working on finding out everything we could about the release of these documents to the New York Times. Um, on the 24th of July, I'm summoned to the White House in these words. Ehrlichman called me up, Bud, run over here right now. The President's very, very upset. He wants to see us immediately. Well, I ran across West Executive Drive, up the stairs, right through the Cabinet Room, right into the President's office with, with Ehrlichman. The President is walking behind his desk, pacing, slamming his fist into his hand. He said, we're not going to allow this. What had happened that day is the fallback position of the United States in the strategic arms limitation talks that were then going on in Helsinki had been leaked to the New York Times. And the President said, I, we cannot put up with this. And you probably have seen a lot of these transcripts of the President's meetings. They have a lot of expletives, uh, deleted. Uh, but when you're in a meeting with them, they're not deleted. You get the full brunt of the intensity of the President's feeling, and I got that in spades in that meeting. And I felt that the combination of the leak of the Pentagon Papers that were top secret, the leak of the fallback position in the SALT talk to the New York Times constituted a national security crisis. Now, intelligence came into the unit from the CIA that a full set of the Pentagon Papers had been released to the, New to the Soviet Embassy before they had gotten to the New York Times. Now, in that hot atmosphere of intensity, like maybe there's some foreign involvement, maybe this just isn't one person releasing these documents, is he working with the Soviets? These are things that are going through our minds, and it was in that context that E. Howard Hunt recommended that an entry operation be undertaken into the office of Dr. Lewis Fielding. He was Dr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist in Beverly Hills, California to find out if Dr. Ellsberg had said things to his doctor under psychoanalysis that would lead us to understand his mental state, his likelihood to release other top secret documents, was he under pressure from the Soviets, everything we wanted, we wanted to find out everything we could about this man, Dr. Ellsberg, who we defined in the unit as an enemy and as a traitor. Now, I'm, I'm putting these words out there because when you have pressure like this coming from the President who wanted results, it doesn't really give you the opportunity to think through and maybe question what you're being asked to do. We got a recommendation from these gentlemen, E. Howard Hunt and Gordon Liddy, who joined that recommendation of David Young and me that a covert operation be undertaken. And I'm going to give you the words that were written down in a memorandum that David Young and I wrote to John Ehrlichman. This is in writing. We recommend that a covert operation be undertaken to examine all of the files still held by Dr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist. And underneath are two lines, approve, disapprove. John Ehrlichman wrote his big E in after the approval and then wrote underneath it, under your assurance it is not traceable. Now, this is the kind of language on which decisions are made as to whether people are going to prison or not. Uh, I took that as authority for a covert operation. What we could have said, and probably it would have been more accurate, and I might have been fired if I'd written it, was we recommend that a second-degree burglary under the laws of the state of California be undertaken to examine all of the files still held by Dr. Ellsberg's psychiatrist. That's what's really happening, a second-degree burglary but you cover it up with terminology that camouflages what you're really doing. You're almost dealing with mirrors sometimes. You're not really communicating what's happening. And in a way, you're trying to give the person who's approving it deniability. And that's really what happened is this whole thing ensued. Ehrlichman said, I never approved what happened. Now, let me tell you what happened. The gentleman went to California. They carried on. Uh, they went into the office. They broke a window on the way in. And to make it look like it had been a drug operation, they smashed up the office. And then they left. They came back and said, we'd like to go back and go after the apartment. I said, but you've shown me pictures of a damaged office. They said, well, yeah, we didn't get them the first time around. We'd like to go back again. Well, I showed those pictures to John Ehrlichman, who said, shut it down. That's beyond anything that I approved. And we did. We shut it down. That was the story. 
That's as of September 3rd, 1971, a break-in has occurred, nothing has been found, and we shut it down. Three months later, Gordon Liddy leaves the White House and goes to work for the committee to reelect the president. I basically engineered that departure. I felt it was a good thing for him to have a new opportunity. Um, I was relieved of any responsibility in that unit uh, because I would not approve the installation of a warrantless wiretap on another investigation. So John Ehrlichman called up and said, we understand you don't want to do it. David Young does. You have a lot of other things to do. You're relieved. So it's over, right? That's done. It's a busted operation. It's done. We don't have to worry about it. Fast forward, let's say about, I'll show you the timeline here. Um, this shows you the timeline, and I'm going to go right to this date here, June 1972. I was in St. Louis between the Park Plaza Hotel and the Chase. I see this story about the break-in into the Watergate Hotel. I read the names. I know exactly what has happened. These guys have gone on and done something in the political context like they had done for me the year before in the national security context. The thesis of the book, one of the theses, is that Watergate could not have occurred but for what happened in September of 1971. If we had said no in 1971, this White House will not tolerate this kind of conduct. The likelihood of the two of them, G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt, going on to work for the committee to reelect and recommending a break-in of the Democratic National Committee, I think, is very, very remote. And if we had shut it down in 1971 and they'd done it anyway, there would have been no need after Watergate to pay hush money to those uh, parties to keep them from disclosing what had happened in 1971. You see the linkage between all those different things? Let me move one forward here to another. So here's the sort of the... Pentagon Papers leaked, Plumber's Covert Operation, September. See how quickly those came together? Now there's a, some time gap. It's really not, it's not scaled to, to the time. Break-in at the Watergate Hotel, June 72. Operation revealed May 1973. Nixon resigns August of 1974. Well, for quite some time, I defended myself on this as this was a national security operation. That's the way the president defined it. That's what I felt was at stake. And I did that before various grand juries. I did it before congressional committees. But then something happened in November of 1973. I had been under Secretary of Transportation. I'd had to resign. I, again, I had defended. I'd taken the Fifth Amendment several times. And then I went to this place. Have you all visited Williamsburg? I would assume that's pretty close by for a lot of you. I was out behind the House of Burgesses one evening, before, just after Thanksgiving, it was on Friday. And I was with my children and my wife, and sometimes things become crystal clear in your life where you finally realize what's at stake. And it took me a long time, too long to get here. Where it looked at this, my children are playing right here. I'm under indictment in Washington, D.C. I'm under indictment in California, and yet I'm able to drive down here, come out behind this beautiful building with your kids, and you can talk to a reporter of your choice. You can go to the church of your choice. I went through all the rights that I was enjoying as a person under indictment, but released on his own recognizance. An amazing set of rights. Now, what are you defending? Well, I'm defending the right of someone in the government under what I then felt was some questionable doctrine of national security to strip away from another American citizen his right to be free from an unreasonable, warrantless search. How can you enjoy all these rights and defend that without being the first worst, worst form of hypocrite? Just as you can't. And then the second realization came that was just as powerful is that this conduct struck at the heart of what this government was established to protect against, and you did it. Now, I'm not telling you all that I'm right about this because Richard Nixon never agreed with me on this premise. But at that moment in Williamsburg, I felt free, finally. This was how I felt about it. I turned to Suzanne. I said, I've got to plead guilty, and I need to do it right away. Within about 
four days, I was before this gentleman. Does that ring a bell? Some of you, Leon Jaworski, special prosecutor. I told him I wanted to plead guilty on the condition that he would agree that I would be sentenced by a court before I needed to testify to a grand jury or anyone else. I'm not here trading a plea for a lighter sentence. Why? Because I'm going to have to testify against my friends, and I want to be sentenced for what I did, not what I might deliver against somebody else. And I'm eternally grateful to Leon Jaworski for accepting the plea on that basis. So I, I, four days after that, I went before Judge Gerhard Gazelle, and I pleaded guilty. And it was very short. It took about five minutes to say I, my sole defense was that I acted on behalf of national security. I no longer believe that. Therefore, I have no defense. Uh, and he said, fine, I'll see you in six weeks. So I came back six weeks later. Um, that was out in front of the courthouse in Washington, D.C., right after being sentenced uh, by Judge Gerhard Gazelle for two to six years uh, in prison. I don't think you all can read that, but it just says, Your Honor, these have been days when I wondered whether we were ever going to see the light, but from these hearings, investigations, indictments, convictions, and sentences, I have great hope that what is actually being done is a wonderful healing process whereby what this country represents and what it means are going to be more clearly understood. Um, that's actually just the, the, the text of what he said there. So he sentenced me from two to six years in prison, and he sentenced it all but for six months, and I went to jail. Uh, a cartoonist from uh, Orlando newspaper <laughs> drew this cartoon. <laughs> Actually, it's better to be known as Birdman than some of the other things you could have been called, but that reads, Eagle Crow, huh? Say, you're not the famous Birdman of Alcatraz, are you? Uh, we didn't wear hats uh, in prison, but I'm this rookie uh, convict over here, and this guy's looking down. So that was put on the bulletin board in the, in the prison where I was. And uh, I started my prison experience in the Rockville Jail, a maximum security jail in Washington, D.C., right outside Washington, D.C., um, jail was an extraordinarily helpful experience for me because I knew I was there and I think I was the only guilty person in prison, uh, at least the ones that I met. Um, and the first day I went into jail, it was a lockup, two mattresses. One guy is sitting his back against the wall in one mattress. I walk in and he's pretty badly bruised and I have to choose where to sit. And I said, well, I need a friend. So I went over and I sat down next to this gentleman. And we sat there for a minute. He looked over at me and he said, Krogh, I like the way you did that. I went, oh, geez, he knows where I am. He said, um, I've seen you on TV. You're a stand-up guy and I'm going to tell you how to live in jail. And I got Jail Survival 101 for about an hour and a half. It was absolutely the most helpful thing at that moment, such things as don't talk to the guards. You don't need to chit-chat with the guards. They're those guys, you chit-chat with us, but not with the guards. And then he said something very profound. He said, you come in here as a white dude, as a Nixon lawyer. Don't you never hold yourself out better than anybody in this place? Because if you do, somebody's going to hurt you. And don't do it because it ain't true. I mean, that is just, imagine now, this is the first person that I'm seeing in jail. And I'm, I've come increasingly to believe in the and a higher power, placing people in your life at precisely the point that you need them. It's synchronicity, whatever it is, and I was so grateful for that. And I got my first job offer uh, in jail from a guy who I'd gotten to know, and he said, uh, well, bud, he said, uh, I specialize in stereos. And I said, what, what do you mean you specialize in stereos? He said, well, I, uh, there's certain kind of stereos I can fence very well. I've made a lot of money at it. He said, would you like to work with me when you get out, or are you going to go straight? <laughs> and, uh, and it's the kind of question that you don't really expect. And I said, you know, I'd given crime a, a shot, and I wasn't very good at it. He said, oh, my God, you guys are the worst I've ever seen. Why didn't you call somebody who had expertise? You know, I could have helped you out. I said, I didn't have your number. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's a bizarre conversation, but, you know, that, that was nice that somebody wanted to work with me. And uh, so I was grateful for that. I moved on to another prison where they check your teeth when you come in, and I noticed that the guy is holding the tray with sharp, sharp pointed instruments is a Frenchman 
who had been uh, convicted for heroin smuggling, and I'd helped put him away uh, with others, and he know, knows that I'm in a prison with him. And I'm shuffling towards the front of the line, and he sees me coming, and he sees that I am very nervous and not a happy camper moving up towards the front. And he stepped out, came towards me, and he said, Monsieur Krog, do not be afraid. As I see it, you were a professional in your business. I was a professional in mine, and we both screwed up. <laughs> and he, be he became my best friend. He gave me his blue jeans when he moved on to another prison. And um, I found that all my needs were met uh, in prison or jail. There, were, there was one time that I had to sort of prove that I belonged there. And it was where somebody also saw me and said, you know, you shouldn't be here. You did what you thought was right and all the rest. I said, wait just a second. I violated 18 U.S. Code Section 241, deprivation of rights of citizens. That's a constitutional crime. That's okay, okay, man, okay. I know, you're a bad dude. I got it, all right. But it was almost having to establish your malafides to be accepted as a bona fide prisoner in that environment. It's, it's the world's a little bit different. Jail, I learned a lot from it. Uh, I don't recommend it uh, to people, but it's something that, that I felt was, was helpful for me. Now, I'm going to fast forward to something because what happened in the interim, I got out of prison, I went through a legal process, I was disbarred, and then this happened in 2001. I was watching the Bush White House staff get signed, sworn in. And I saw them get sworn in in the same room where I was sworn in 30 years before. And I looked at my commission that I had received and these words jumped out at me. Now, this is about seven years ago. Reposing special trust and confidence in your integrity, prudence, and ability, I do appoint you deputy assistant to the President of the United States of America. The words, your integrity. I never read those words before. I had seen, is it signed by the President? Yes. Signed by the Secretary of State? Yes. This was just sort of jargon to make it look more impressive. But then it dawned on me, he said, that's really what that job required, was my integrity. What had happened to me when I went into that position? I showed you those earlier photographs of Nixon and Ehrlichman, and my loyalty was to them personally. So what I did was write an article, memo to the White House staff. I have some extra copies of it, as some of you would like, which I, in which I basically told them, um, this is what I wished I had learned 30 years ago. And I mentioned that their personal integrity was crucial to being successful in those jobs. The questions they should ask about any recommendation they make to the president, is it whole and complete? Have I thought it through? Hot dog story. Have I thought through the consequences of it? The same thing for Judge Carswell. Clearly we weren't thinking through the consequences of a covert operation in 1971. That's the first question. The second question is the moral question, the ethical question, is it right? We just didn't ask it. During that seven-week period, the questions we did ask was, who can do it, when can they do it, how long will it take, and how much will it cost? See, all the operational questions, but we didn't get to the legal question or the ethical questions. And I also had a, a, a short aside in this. To the lawyers, use interpretations of the law that are generally well accepted and not what words like national security, commander-in-chief, can be tortured into meaning. There's a torture memo from the Office of Legal Counsel that was tortured into meaning what they wanted to do with the interrogation protocols that were eventually put in place in Abu Ghraib. So maybe they didn't read the memo. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but I sent that in 2001. For the next few years, I thought through what is it that I wished I had learned? What were the lessons that I've learned from this? And came up with the idea of the integrity zone, uh, which is this. Uh, you can't see it very clearly, but it's in the website, you know, www.budcrogue.com. And what it basically does is give three basic questions. Is it whole and complete? Is it right? Is it good? That's the heart of it. And these are the threats trying to pull you out of that zone. Each one of those threats I encountered during a seven-week period on the White House staff working and on the plumbers. I'm going to move forward quickly. Group think. 
I'm going to highlight just this one because that was in spades what happened to that group. And I'm going to show you a picture. Discerning group think, do you feel undue pressure from le leaders, strong peer pressure? Are you able to share your views freely and without fear of reprisal? Do you feel invulnerable? Are you stereotyping opponents as enemies? This is just some from an excellent book written on this topic. I'm going to show you a picture of group think in action. We all know, do, maybe you all know who these are. Obviously, you know who he is. Okay, I'm going to listen for if you all know who these are. Who's this? John Mitchell, what was his position? J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI. John Arlegan. Uh, you don't need to know Tricia um, or Julie or David. Okay, here's the way this meeting goes. Well, I think that we probably should make this a federal crime to kill a policeman in the line of duty. What do you think, John? Mr. President, I think that's a brilliant idea. I think it's exactly what we should do. Edgar, what do you think? Well, I agree with the Attorney General. I think that's exactly what we should do. We ought to make that a federal crime. John, what do you think? Well, I agree with Edgar and the Attorney General, Mr. President. I think that's a brilliant idea. But, yep, 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 yeah, I agree. I think that's right. So what happens? It goes from the President, the AG, Director of the FBI, Counsel of the President, to Mr. Yup Yup over here. Now, I saw that phenomenon repeated over and over and over again. In the White House, I've seen it in business. I've seen it in law firms. It's where people come in and they don't feel that they can speak candidly, speak openly, be honest as to what they really feel. Groupthink is a phenomenon we see all the time. It's just when it happens in a national security or foreign policy environment that it can be very, very risky and dangerous. Any questions on this one? Because this is one. Yes, ma'am. I noticed that your eyes are kind of down. Yes, I'm looking down. Yeah. What does that mean? Uh, when will this photo session be over? I think it's uh, uh, looking appropriately stern. You know, I mean, these are my wife's caption for this. What's a nice guy like you doing in a place like this? You know, I mean, these when you think about who were the heaviest duty guys in law enforcement in the world at that point, you, it doesn't get any heavier than this group. And I aspired to be part of it. And that's it. Yes, sir. Paul. Well, Philip, um, obviously, the president is just a president. Yes. 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 Not in this meeting. Not a good one. Not a good one. And it's one where I did take the opportunity afterwards to point out to Ehrlichman that 95 percent of those crimes are solved by local police, and we don't need the FBI to get involved in it. But in this meeting, there was no chance. I mean, this is a meeting, and unfortunately, sometimes decisions are taken in meetings like this, and you don't have a second chance to go back and try to correct it. It's very difficult, but I point this out. I mean, have any of you experienced this? How many of you experience groupthink in your professional lives? Just So it's not, it's not uncommon to see this. It's just that it's risky and dangerous when you get to this, to this level. And that was one of the things that happened in the White House plumbers that led to the decision in 1971, and then move ahead. Sir? That is, now that's an interesting point. You saw the, the room where Elvis met with the president. This is in the old executive office building. Nixon had a friendly room, and actually it was sort of decorated the way President Carter's Oval Office is. This is where he would come over and relax, have more private meetings. It was actually two offices down from my office in the old EOB that I showed you in the building the picture of the old EOB. This is the president's office. Sir, yes, ma'am. Moving to the situation where it did not follow that scenario, and then what? When it did not follow the scenario, um, in other words, somebody said, no, I disagree. And if a person disagreed in a meeting with the president uh, and the president was not pleased with it, that was his last meeting. 
I saw that happen. It, it was, and presidents, you know, they need to be very careful as to how they run those meetings so they're not intimidating people into the position where they're not able to do that. Now, the book, The Victims of Groupthink, written by Professor Irving Janus, describes the Bay of Pigs discussions that Kennedy had right after he was elected. Groupthink was really in play during the Bay of Pigs discussion, but not the Cuban Missile Crisis. He learned from that. And a lot of it was, rather than meet people in groups, let's talk one-on-one. -on -one. In other words, you don't have to try to key your response to me to what the gentleman next to you said. I just want to hear from you. And Kennedy did a brilliant job in the way that he got honest information in the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's interesting to contrast those two. Is that all clear? Because this, this is what I'm trying to teach now to kids in law schools and public affairs around the country because I feel very strongly about this. And I've seen in the current administration some group think at work in some of these offices. <laughs> okay, maybe you don't agree with me on that. <laughs> no, that's a, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, ma'am. No, I, I wasn't aware. That was the only world I knew. I, I will tell you at that point, I, I felt that I was in the best job in the world. I mean, to be able to sit in meetings with these gentlemen and be taken seriously, and I'm 31 years old, uh, was just the ultimate. I didn't feel uncomfortable. You look unhappy, yeah. Well, I look unhappy, but uh, you know, it's like that's professional sternness. It's, it's not where I'm really an unhappy camper there. Uh, I mean, to even be invited into this was an important opportunity for me. Uh, and that's where vanity comes in sometimes. You begin to believe your own stuff that I must be pretty important or pretty smart. Not true. Uh, but you, you can almost fake yourself into thinking that in those situations. There was another hand. Yes, sir. Well, some of the meetings were like Elvis. There's no background. You just go in and have the meetings. Some of them you do have good background. And even though you might give the background material and talking points, he doesn't necessarily follow them. He will do what he wants in those meetings. You hope that you can sort of, you know, channel it along a way that you'll get to a, a rational, lucid outcome. And when we weren't talking about serious national security issues, he was darn good about some things, that he wanted to get the bottom of things and drill down to find the real facts before he would make a policy judgment. But it, it varied. It wasn't true all the time. Internal threats, I'm not going to spend much time on this because this is what I actually do for students. Misplaced loyalty, the reason I put that there is because this is an actual quote from Chuck Colson, I would walk over my grandmother's body for Richard Nixon. Uh, he's had a really major transformation of, of, of a nature. I've never seen a, a change so profound as what Chuck Colson was in Richard Nixon's White House as to what he became when he went through the litigation process. It was a real Paul and Root to Damascus experience. And I've talked to a number of, of friends who feel that you know, but for this experience, Chuck Colson would not have been able to make the contribution that he has in prison reform. I mean, it sounds odd, but I think he's done a better job in what he's been doing than if he'd made just a ton of money as a lawyer in Washington, D.C. Um, discerning loyalty, I just put these out there. And the reason I put those out there is because Judge Gazelle, when he sentenced me to prison, and I'll see if I can find it, he actually had read everything. And I'm going to read this quote. This is from his sentencing transcript. He's looking down at me. Now, you're in a courthouse in Washington, D.C. In acknowledging your guilt, you have made no effort, as you very well might have, to place the primary blame on others who initiated and approved the undertaking. A wholly improper, illegal task was assigned to you by higher authority, and you carried out because of a combination of loyalty and, I believe, a degree of vanity thereby compromising your obligations as a lawyer and as a public servant. And then he concluded anything short of prison would not be acceptable. I put those out there, and those are part of the things in the integrity zone. Are your loyalties properly balanced, or are they entirely personal? Now, how many of you watched the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings six weeks ago, maybe seven weeks ago, when Sarah Taylor, who is the former 
political director, George Bush, was before them. It was on the attorney, uh, U.S. attorney firings. And she couldn't say certain things because they were invoking executive privilege. And she was asked by Senator Leahy, why did you, are, are you going along with Counsel Fred Fielding? Well, she said, because when I was in the White House and I swore to serve the President of the United States, and do you all remember what happened at that point? You want to share? You remember? The chairman said, you didn't swear to serve the President of the United States. You swore to uphold the Constitution of the United States, as did I. But the very fact that that would just come out inadvertently today shows you the grip once you're in that environment. That's what I, I'm trying to communicate is how tight you're in. You know, I might be looking stern, but you better look stern there. Those are stern guys. Those are not going to be out there doing, you know, a cacaracha. That's not their, their thing. And Senator Perry, uh, or whatever, it seems to be the word of the day. Yeah, it is. What it is is to keep you from testifying to things that may be embarrassing to the president of the White House. They use that a lot these days. We use it a lot, too. I put this up there because that's when I was sworn in to be undersecretary of transportation. This is Warren Berger. My wife, I'm swearing, my hand is on the Bible, there's Richard Nixon. Now, that's a very nice ceremony, but I don't really remember what I said at that point. He's reading it from here, he's got a little card, and then I'm repeating back, and if people are taking pictures like this, you put this on your wall. But that is an important thing when you're putting your hand on the Bible and you're swearing to uphold the Constitution. That's what I'm trying to communicate to kids, whether they're in law school or whatever. That is an important part of it. Yes, you're going to be loyal to him. He gave me the job. But it have, you have to balance those properly. It's not whatever this gentleman might ask you to do. It's what he might ask you to do as tempered by and governed by my obligation to the Constitution. That sounds simple, but in that environment, it's not. And that's what I'm trying to equip young people when they go into these jobs. Yes, sir, please. Yes, I'm going to get to that because then I should move ahead here because I want you all to have a chance to ask questions. But is this point clear about balancing those loyalties because this is so critical? Here is the oath. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter, so help me God. That's what you swear. That's what should govern you. And that, by the way, is in the foreword of the book written by Daniel Ellsberg which we both did not take seriously when we did certain things in the government. I'm not going to spend more time on this because you can see this. These are the three key questions. Is it whole and complete? Is it right? And is it good? And they're not all the same. This one brings in a spiritual dimension that's very important. Never even came to my mind when I was in those jobs. Those are the three levels. Is it whole and complete? Is it right? Is it good? Those are the values that I feel apply to each one of those. This has taken a long time to try to understand how those things line up. This is one that I was not very good at, humility. Authentic, true to authentic self, openness, truth, honesty, fairness, these values. If you're serving those, you have a good shot at being ethical. <coughs> Intellectual, intelligence, judgment, competence, understanding, context, balanced loyalties. How many of you are Rotarians here? Have been in Rotary? <coughs> Nobody? Here's the Rotarians' four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it bring goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Now, this is, um, this is the highest mountain in Mount Rainier. After I got out of prison, I'm going to get to your question about what happened with Richard Nixon. I had promised myself that after prison I would go out to Washington State and I would climb Mount Rainier. And I went out, drove across the country with my family, got there around the 
4th of August, did some training up in the mountains. Then on the 7th of August, I went up on Mount Rainier with my, my brother-in-law and my two nieces. We've been trained by Rainier Mountaineering, Inc., which is the group that prepares you to climb the mountain. And on the morning of August 8th, uh, we left. Actually, it was the night of August 8th. We left this part here, Camp Muir, 10,400 feet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Drink something here. That's a, that is the normal route up Mount Rainier. The symbolism of this was just almost overpowering for me. We crossed the Cowlitz Glacier around 1 o'clock in the morning, went up Cathedral Gap, went up here to the Ingram Flats, and we went up the Disappointment Cleaver. Uh, they have great names for things. I mean, this mountain really inspires you. This is Cadaver Gap over here. Um, worked our way up, got up to the top around... 6 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock, Washington, D.C. time. It started coming down right about here. This was happening. He was in the East Room of the White House resigning. And I'm just going to read you a couple of quotes from his speech while I'm climbing down. Uh... The young must know it, the old must know it, it must always sustain us because the greatness comes not when things go always good for you, but when you are really tested, when you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes, because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. And he was saying those words as I'm coming down from the highest mountain on Mount Rainier, Mount Rainier in Washington. And uh, as we get down below here, and now, of course, I can't hear any of this. There's another group coming up, and they're singing. We have a new president. We have a new president. We have a new president. I stopped, and I took off my pack, and I realized it's over. And he's going, as he said, into the valley. And so... Um, I just stood there because you're pretty tired coming down from this mountain anyway. It's a, it's a real grunt to get to the top and come down. Adding that on top of it was just huge. And then, that fact, this is where it happened, right about here, when that group was coming up climbers. That's Camp Muir. The, the reason what's, I'm putting this to you is because I knew I had to go see Richard Nixon right away after that experience. Remember that picture? That's the last one before, as president, he gets on the on the helicopter, Marine One. You know that, and he's off, and he goes out to California. I called down there right after I got off the mountain. I said I'd like to come see the president, and it took a little negotiation. And I described this meeting in the book, what it was like to see him. They had to wait for a while before I could get some time. Two weeks after the 9th, on the 24th of August, I was ushered in to his office in San Clemente, just a few years after I'd been given the plumber's task in 1971. And I walked in, and I said, I'm, I'm here, Mr. President, because I just want to tell you I care for you. I'm very sorry what happened. And he said, I feel responsible for what happened to you. I said, well, I appreciate that. I said, I had to finally understand my role in what occurred in, 19, in 1971. And he turned to me, Bud, should I plead guilty? I said, well, Mr. President, do you feel guilty? He said, no, I don't. I said, well, pleading guilty is not a public relations game. You either feel that you're guilty or you're not. I said, I felt legally culpable, not just responsible, but legal, legally culpable, and that meant there had to be a price to pay. He said, well, what was jail like? Now, he's not pardoned. He said, well, you have a choice. You can either make the best of it or you can feel sorry for yourself. I chose to learn how to drive the Massey Ferguson 1105 tractor. And I said, I got pretty good at that, you know, in the three months that I was there, you know, plowing and disking and harrowing and going through the spring season. 
and he got a call from Nelson Rockefeller. And I didn't hear Rockefeller's side of it, but I heard Nixon's side of it. Well, no, I just don't think it would be a good idea for the President of the United States to be in the D.C. jail. So I knew that he was probably going to do everything he could to avoid having to go to prison. We were together for about an hour and a half. It was a very emotional time for both of us. I felt deeply sorry about what had happened. The day before, I had gone to Beverly Hills and had apologized to Lewis Fielding, to his face. Because while you can plead guilty and serve a prison term until you've said you're sorry to the person who was the victim of what you did, you haven't closed the loop. And he was very kind to me. I mean, it just it helped me get, get on with it. So I went back to my office afterwards up in Seattle where I was working on my reinstatement process. And I was writing a letter to the president about what taking responsibility really means. And it's not just saying the words, I'm responsible, end of story. Is there a pattern of criminality like obstruction of justice for which you need to pay a price? And I felt that the pattern of obstruction of justice was overwhelming for Richard Nixon right after Watergate up until he resigned. I was just about to put it into the final uh, draft and send it down to him, and President Gerald Ford granted him a full, complete, and unconditional pardon for any crimes he may he committed or may have committed while as President of the United States. Now, I write in the book, you know, pardons leave things unfinished. They, you just, it's hard to get traction if you haven't been able to face up to it directly. Richard Nixon never felt guilty of a crime. And remember the great line that he gave to David Frost? When the president does it, that means it is not illegal. Now the consequences of that are staggering, but he believed that deeply. And trying to understand why, what, what happened here? What were we instilled with? You, you asked a very interesting question about you're looking angry, you're looking down. Richard Nixon himself, and I'm going to just quote one short paragraph, not a full paragraph, but actually from the end of the book, where he was trying to articulate what had happened to him and why he was there in the East Room resigning his office. After acknowledging those staff members who had given so much to their country, thanking those who had stood by him, and expressing his adoration for his saintly mother, he said, this is a quote, always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. In the last paragraph, to me this comment explained in large measure why Nixon had to resign his office. Hatred is a voracious appetite that consumes those who indulge it. Those of us who committed a crime in 1971 were partly driven by the hatred that the president expressed toward Ellsberg and others who displeased him. The tragedy in this is that Nixon was also capable of the highest vision and execution of the boldest initiatives. His devotion to peace among the nations of the world, which he pursued with idealism and a ruthless pragmatism, left an enduring legacy that benefits the world order to this day. If only the hatreds had been kept more firmly in check during his presidency and his better angels, the angels that recognized the saintliness of his mother had been dominant, the world would be a different and better place today, if only. And that's the, that's the end of the book. And um, I had this one thing on my wall that was given to me years ago that uh, I really hope that young people and others will put on their walls. This is by a wonderful Greek philosopher, Heraclitus. Uh, it might be, not be hard to read. I'll read it to you. It's called The Light of Integrity. The soul has dyed the color of its thoughts. Think only on those things that are in line with your principles and can bear the full light of day. The content of your character is your choice. Day by day, what you choose, what you think, and what you do is who you become. Your integrity is your destiny. It is the light that guides your way. Heraclitus, Greek poet and philosopher. I just think that's a beautiful thing to, to be guided by. Well, we've come to the end of 
my comments. Uh, I'll stay and answer questions that any of you might have or observations. Um, Paul's first. Yeah. I'll get the question, would, would it be possible at that time to have basically said no or to have raised enough questions so that could not have gone forward? The answer is yes, I could have done that. That's the question I've asked myself so many times. And I turned down a warrantless wiretap in December. Why could I do that in December but not turn down a covert operation recommendation in August? What happened during that four-month period? I got scared to death when I saw the photographs of what those guys had done on the 3rd of September 1971 and Gordon Liddy showing me a combat knife that he was prepared to use in Beverly Hills. I realized I'm in deeper than I ever dreamed I would be here. So that precipitated my saying no in December. Could I have done it in August? In August, I was setting up the International Narcotics Control Cabinet Committee. I was working hard on the Special Action Office for Drug Abuse Prevention, which was the treatment program. I spent 5% max of my time on the plumbers in August. Now, that's a criminal error in terms of not being present when decisions are being made that can affect, really, the future of the entire administration. I was overwhelmed. I had a little special office in room 16 that I would go circuitously within the old EOB to get to to talk to those guys. My secretary didn't know about it. Nobody in my family knew about it. It was impressed with the highest secrecy, the highest urgency. Could I, in that environment, have asked the questions that you're suggesting? I like to think the answer is yes, but I just didn't. And that's, you know, I was mentioning vanity and ego before. What's galled me for a long time, and Roger knows this, Roger, my best friend, is I thought I was better than that. You see, then they'll let that one get by me. But it did. But as you pointed out, people got risk for having to say. Yes, they did. And I wasn't about ready to risk that. But they have been dismissed. Yes, they have. That's true. I would have been dismissed. And I'll tell you, leaving that job in 1971 would have been like leaving my right arm. I mean, I love that work. I mean, I can't tell you how, how much that, that, for me, not to be able to serve in government after this was one of the worst sentences. It's a life sentence. You know, you can't do it anymore. But I wasn't willing to risk that in 1971. I just wasn't willing to risk it. I would today. I know. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. That's the answer to his question. I think you're right. I was just not alert to it. I was caught up in it, completely imbued with how Richard Nixon saw the presidency. He told me once when I asked him, I said, what would you tell people in my classes where I was teaching foreign policy? How do you make policy? He said, well, well, but, you know, well, but, Charles, I think, well, but, you've got to have idealism and some good public relations, but you back it up with a ruthless pragmatism. I mean, that's the way he sort of saw the world. He was a, a realist in many ways. And some of us prided ourselves in being tough realists, carrying out what he wants done. He demanded performance in the jobs we were doing. And if you couldn't perform, you had to leave. And he kept track when he'd give you an assignment. Uh, whether you'd done the job properly. But at the age of 29, when I started there, you saw the picture of getting sworn in. Yes, sir.
Yeah, that's a good question. And, and, and my constitutional law professor, Bob, um, Bob Andrews, <laughs> uh, I did very well in law school, in constitutional law. And when I went back to take the bar exam the second time around, there's a, there was a deal there where if you've taken the bar review course and you fail the exam, you can take the course again for free. And so I went in to sign up the second time after I'd been reinstated by the, by the uh, court in Washington State. And as I went, went in to sign up, it's several hundred dollars. It's expensive. And this woman looked up at me and she said, well, let me check your record. You took the bar exam here in 1968. And I said, hmm, yeah, you, you passed the written part of it. But as far as I'm concerned, Mr. Krogh, you passed the written portion before, but you failed the practicum in the Fourth Amendment. Uh, that constitutes a failure in my view, and here's your free ticket for our course. You know, I just got, <laughs> I didn't kiss her, but I wanted to. Um, the, the problem in law school for, for me was that I, I was good at being able to read the law and answer the questions, but I don't think that I had that deep cellular feeling about what our Constitution really means. It didn't come to me until I was going through this experience. It gets to sort of your point here. When you're not 29 or 30, you've mastered all of the, the academic aspects of studying the law, but that's not enough. I think you have to feel these, these courses and really understand them at a level. Poor Justin Long was a paralegal for two years before he went to law school. I mean, we would have these, we were in a small room, and you can imagine what it's like. No, Justin, do you feel it? You've got to feel this, because it's, it's not just an academic intellectual exercise uh, to learn the law and what it really means in this country. And I've thought a lot about law school curricula. Uh, what, can you, what can you build into it so when young people are going to get these jobs, they're going to be there, and a lot of them are in there now. They're not going to be sort of swept along by what some leader wants them to do. G go ahead. You, you want to follow well, up I on that? Think, I think my experience was I didn't get it quite, maybe like you saw. I don't feel that. I, I almost lost some respect for law because you, you come in here with an idea of writing law. And you write law and you write law and you write law. Well, yeah, there's got to be an easier way. I mean, that, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do with this. That's why I wrote the book, in a way, is that if, if I had read this kind of book at 29, written by somebody who had started at 29 and said, well, here's what happened, and here was the meeting, and here's the judgment that I made, and if I'd asked these questions, would I made a different decision? I like to think so, but I'm not sure. You see, I, I want to be clear about that. This is, this is not a prescription of answers. It's a menu of questions that I think are different than the kind of questions we asked in law school when you're ans answering law school exam questions. Oh, you bet. I don't know about your professional responsibility course, but mine, the professor bribed us. He said, if you'll come to the course in professional responsibility every day, I won't, um, I, I'll, I'll pass you. What does that mean? Well, it just means you show up. Well, and then you have that on the test. I'll tell you, when I took the bar exam the second time, the third day, I had to take the three-day exam in Washington State. The third day in the afternoon is ethics. I studied ethics more than anything else before that exam. I was the last one to leave the exam room because I could just see this headline because the press followed me in to the test room every day that I was there. And I could have passed torts and contracts and civil pro and flunked ethics. And the headline would be, Krog flunks ethics again. You know, and so, so you're finished. So, um, well, that was tough. I had two law schools, uh, Gonzaga Law School and the University of Washington, assigned people to help me get through the bar exam. I had 40 days from the decision of the court that you're reinstated when I had to take the exam. And one of them, after they'd been working with me for a week, said, you're the cleanest slate I've ever seen. You don't know anything, do you? And I said, not a whole lot. It's been 11 years. And they said, well, we think this is likely to be on the test. And, and our professors have taught us this. And when I went in, I had the thinnest knowledge. I didn't really have a lot of angst in answering the questions because I only knew so much. I didn't have to worry about what did that professor say. I didn't remember what they told me back in 66. I'm taking the test in 1980. Fortunately, they were right, and they got me through. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Um, I'd like to hear you tell me about the plumbers. Um, oh, boy. Yeah, telling my family about the plumbers. Well, uh, I told my family about it in 1972, 
after Watergate and what had happened the year before. And it was, I didn't tell them about it in 1971. I didn't speak to anybody. You can compartmentalize information in a way that just didn't happen. It's, you put it on the shelf. But after Watergate, uh, I got a call from John Dean coming back from St. Louis. And the call was, Bud, we're in big trouble. And I knew that. I mean, and then I talked to my wife. I said, I'm in big trouble. Here's the deal. Now, we were able to get through that whole year, 1972, not thinking anything was going to blow. Or, and I was nominated to be an undersecretary of the cabinet uh, department and go through the hearing without any questions coming up that were bad questions. And Suzanne was a very good ally through this whole thing. But when it came time to plead guilty in November of 1974, 1973, down in Williamsburg that I mentioned, that was very difficult because that was a certain prison sentence. There was nobody who was going to avoid prison, nor would prison have been a good thing, nor would a pardon have been a good thing. And she and I talked about pardons because Richard Nixon wanted to pardon me. And I'd gone to David Eisenhower beforehand and said, I do not want a pardon. Can you imagine what my career would have been like if I'd been pardoned by Richard Nixon after pleading guilty? I'm done. I'm going to, you know, I'll go out and pump gas somewhere. Um, so prison was essential. And she came around to that and saw it and came up every visiting week that she could, bringing the both, both my boys. And my nine-year-old thought it was cool. God, he can drive a tractor. Dad, Dad you can do something. This is cool. We started working on finding out everything we were good on finding out everything we could have made about time release of these documents to the New York Times. On the 24th of July, I'm on the 24th of July, I'm summoned to the White House and the Ace Workers. But for a run over here, we're right now. The president is here very, very, very upset. He was very, very upset. Very upset. Very upset. Well, I ran across the West Executive Drive. I ran across the West Executive Drive. Right through the Senator's room, right into right through the Senate room, right into the front of the president's office. Walking behind his desk, and the president is 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 walking behind his desk. He said, We're not going to allow this. What the fall back position of the United States, 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 the fall back position of the United